Good evening. Our first song will be number 753. Number 753. We'll sing the first and the third verse. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday square? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, all along the fertile way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, you must reap at the last great day? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have made it possible that we could be here tonight to study more about you. Father, we pray that that what we hear tonight, we will open our hearts and, and be able to, to uh, be attentive and learn, Father, and continue to, to be more Christ-like as we, as we grow here on earth. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would dwell upon, uh, among us and in us, Father, that, that, that we, may, we may do the things, that uh, the, the gifts that we, we've been given uh, will allow us to do, Father. We're just just so so thankful for the blessings of life, Father. And we pray that that as we go through this life with the challenges that we have, Father, that you just keep us lifted up, Father. Help us to in, endure the hard times, Father, and and rejoice in your in your word and in your name, Father. No matter what life hurls at us, Father, we. We know that you are the way and the truth and the light. Father, we, we pray that you would be with the uh, teachers tonight, that, that they would be able to be very effective in their teaching in all the classes and here in the auditorium. Father, we just pray that, that we, just, we just raise you up in everything we do. Father, we love you and we are so thankful for Jesus and what he means to us as our Savior here. Father, we pray all these prayers in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening. Uh, we're starting our study from the book of Job tonight. Uh, here to, yeah, here, here's some. That sounds, yeah. There's some more on the back table. Yeah, we're starting our study from uh, just our topical study of the book of Job tonight. <clears throat> so if you have your Bibles and uh, want to follow along at home, we do have a worksheet for those in the audience tonight. Do we have any new we need to make mention of or send the cards to tonight? Any updates, Lisa?
So Lynn McDaniel and Justin Demps were in car accident in Crossville today. Uh, Justin was taken to Erlanger and Lynn is at the Crossville Hospital. Dusty? Continue your prayer for Sister Claudine Smith. She's got some health issues and been in the hospital and may have to go to rehab. Also, just a few prayers. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brandon Young, he's, he's having some pretty rough time with COVID and IHS. He's just had a So prayer for and um, for Randy Dunn uh, post COVID complications. Uh, he is at the hospital uh, in St. Thomas right now for treatment. Anyone else? Yeah, Gail. Steve Thompson. Is he in the Cookville Hospital? Okay. Steve Thompson in the Cookville Hospital. Uh, he's lost his vision. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Let's go ahead and Father in prayer. Gracious Father, um, we pray, dear Lord, for the ones that we've carried on our hearts. Heavenly Father, the ones that we have made spoken requests, the Lord, maybe even unspoken requests, now, Heavenly Father, Lord, that we pray, Heavenly Father, that a great help uh, will come their way. Heavenly Father, we pray that Justin and Lynn will have no long term effects from our acts. Heavenly Father, as be Sister Claudine, we pray you strengthen her, dear Lord. Uh, may they be able to stabilize her health, dear Lord, and she have a season of strength and health once again. Be with Randy Dunn. Pray that the, the, the complications from um, the, the COVID, Heavenly Father, uh, um, illness, dear Lord, will leave Heavenly Father and his vision return, dear Lord. Be with Steve Thompson as well, Heavenly Father. We pray you bless them in his respective need. Lord, there may be those listening in tonight that are just struggling right now. We pray, Heavenly Father, we lift them up that their that uh, their affliction or or their Troubles, Heavenly Father, may may be eased, Heavenly Father, the Lord, and uh, they'll just have a, a a place of peace and health within their within their life, dear Lord, whether physically and emotionally, Heavenly Father, spiritually, Lord, we pray for them, Heavenly Father, Lord. As we, as we reflect upon Job tonight, we pray that you help our uh, our understanding to increase, dear Lord, and and Heavenly Father, we pray that you help us with ready application to our life and how we move this life, Heavenly Father, and to be. Um, a witness to others, Heavenly Father, and help us be able to have a way to explain uh, this some, somewhat challenging book to me, Father, in ways that, that honor and glorify you, Heavenly Father. We ask all this through your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay. He's, we'll, we'll get you the card, Gail, and then maybe you can help us find where he's at. Um, 
we're starting from the book of Job tonight. The book of Job in, introduces a whole different classification of biblical text. Uh, we ended last week with what's considered the historical books. Uh, and the book of Job actually introduces the poetic books of the Bible. Uh, and I know that, that Job has such a powerful narrative. We sometimes, we, we really sort of don't know what to do. But, but Job is really written in, in, in a poetic fashion. And parts of, if you look in your Bible, parts of it broke out sort of like the Psalms do. Um, especially the arguments of Job's friends and Job. Uh, they're really poems. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're established that way. So um, if we want to put Job, remember the Old Testament is not put it together in chronological order, and it does begin with Genesis, but, and then it, Revelations uh, is the end book for our New Testament. But it, the Bible is not put together in chronological order. It, it's a mishmash of things. So if you were, would, if you were to put Job in a chronological order, you'd probably stop somewhere in, in the book of Genesis, maybe in and around the time of Abraham, and insert Job. Because that's probably the time frame we're talking about. It, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not, we don't have the Mosaic Covenant. We don't have the priestly system. Uh, Job seems like, be more like a patriarch, because he and, he, and, he, he and God have a special relationship. Uh, there is a sacrificial system, but that sacrificial system also predated the Mosaic Covenant, so um, we we wouldn't necessarily you know put Job late. We were putting very early, um, and so uh, sort of chronologically speaking, he, he's pretty early. Uh, authorship is unknown. People have made speculations on, on who may have penned the Book of Job. Some people have even attributed it to Moses. Uh, some people said, well, maybe even Abraham. But uh, typically, uh, we don't we don't know. Um, it is in, in the region of the land of Uz, U-Z. Uh, it's an odd name, but uh, he's in, in, in Uz. So, um, uh, so that's sort of the, the, the foundation. So I'd like to open up discussion right now before I get into to, to my dialogue and diatribe about Job. Uh, I'd like to hear what, what you've got to say, uh, sort of the things that press you, that your takeaway your, your understanding, uh, your maybe some, some of the things that, that you would like to sort of uh, share tonight. So anyone, anyone please just, just open up and, and share. Anything you find odd about the book of Job? Yes, Michelle. You know, why not his wife? You know, uh, she was not the most encouraging of people uh, because she suggests that he just sort of curse God and die. Um, and I, I've really come to respect her and see her from a different light. Um, grieving people and hurt people are sometimes overwhelmed with pain. Um, and we look at Job's loss, but we also need to understand that she's lost all of her children. She's lost their families. I mean, their status within the community is now gone. He, they're, they're, they're impoverished people. Everything has been taken away. And so, hurt people hurt people. You know, I referenced that Sunday. But I, I give her a lot more grace than maybe I would have at earlier times in my life. I just thought she's a harsh woman. Uh, I think she's a hurt woman. Uh, I, I think she's wounded. You know? and, and when you see someone that you love suffering, I mean, Job is a shell of the man he once was. I mean, he's physically described as having sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Uh, and, and, you know, and they're oozing. And, and he, they're festered, you know, he, he, they're itchy. Uh, you know, this is before you had calamine lotion. How many of you remember having chicken pox and being lathered up in calamine lotion? And so Job's, Job's relief is to scrape away the crud and, and crustacean with a piece of broken pottery. I mean, I mean that, that's his relief. He's setting in, in mourning. He has ashes 
on himself. That was, that was an indication of mourning. Uh, he's pitiful. You know, and, and she's hurt, she's wounded. I don't, I don't think she's being bitter toward him. I think she's just broken. You know, and, 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 you know, and we understand that Job in that time is written. We don't have the full understanding of heaven that we have today. But Job 19 tells us that Job believed there had to be something better than what he was experiencing. And, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah. So why didn't God take his wife? Don't know. You know. Uh, we're told in the end of Job that, that he had more kids and family, you know, we, you know, and so it was, the latter was him as, was better than the beginning. It doesn't mention new, necessarily a new wife. Yes, Pat. I don't know if it was better or not. You can't replace that, that's a good point. You can't replace children. Uh, that, that's a good point. And so uh, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a message of perspective. Yes, Linda. No, no. I think she's grieving. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as we go into Psalms, we're going to understand that David, a man after God's own heart, was mad at God a whole lot. You know, in many of the Psalms, he's shaking an angry hand at God. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why are my enemies, you know, winning and I'm losing? And then he'll circle around that same psalm and say, oh, but you've never defeated, you, you, you've never left me abandoned, you've always been there for me, you're my, you're my shield, you're my buckler, you know, you're my tower, you know, all these, all, all these things. So the human condition is, I mean, we're fickle. You know, yes, John. Yeah, it is hard. Um, I, I think I referenced the other other day. Um, uh, Carl Jung, he was a Swiss psychiatrist. You know, he even wrote a book on Job. I mean, he was troubled by Job. You know, uh, and so you know, he he came from a um, Swiss Orthodox uh, uh, background. His 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 grandfather and father had been ministers, so he sort of came from that background, and. Um, he, uh, he was troubled. Now his conclusion, I don't agree with, uh, his conclusion was this is, this is God on trial. That was, that was his conclusion of, of Job. This is, you know, is God righteous? Is God holy? Is God just? You know, I don't take it that way, you know, uh, but that was, that was his perspective and stuff. But um, Job has become, you know, it, it, it's, it's culturally, you know, pretty far uh, reaching people reference Job, you know. Now I still don't understand the origin or history of it, and um, uh, I grew up with people saying the expression "poor as Job's turkey." Anyone ever heard that? Yeah. The poor as Job's turkey. Now I've read the text. There's no mention of a turkey, <laughs> so I don't know where that came from or how that got attributed to Job. But I'm also aware that I, I very often confabulated things as a childhood because uh, when I heard that we all go back to Noe, uh, that's how it was said in, in my, when we all go back to Noe, I, I thought they were talking about Noe Loftus, Uncle Noe Loftus that lived in Jackson County and because, because he was about related to everybody in Jackson County, Herman May, uh, probably Dave Joey and uh, Uncle Noe. And so then I realized, oh, Noah, okay, that Bible guy, okay, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, chubby <laughs> flowers, turkey. Okay, so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's all they could figure out. So yeah, but but Job. I mean, and I, I wish I'd spent time putting it together. Job has been the subject of. Uh, he, he's inspired artists. There are many many artists would would do. 
uh, paintings and drawings and, and, and statues of Job. You know, he, he, he was in, in, in his, in his, in his d disfigured shape and so forth. So, yeah, we, we talked about the patience of Job, you know, um, and, uh, and I, I think that's sort of referenced. Um, when I read Job, he sure made a lot of noise for someone who's patient. He, he, he lamented to God, you know, uh, and we'll sort of maybe tease that out here in a few minutes as to, to Eliyahu, I don't know, I can't remember, I'll have to look his name up here in a second, but the younger companion of the friends, he has a lot of good things to say. Uh, and I think there's a testament to, sometimes we need to use, listen to our young folk. Uh, you know, they're not, wisdom is not necessarily uh, something that only old people have. Uh, they, they don't have a corner on the market. Uh, and, the young, and the young man made some really great accurate statements and he confronts both Job's three friends and Job himself. And he has some uh, different perspective on things I think is worthy to consider as well. So um, chapters one through three, the stage is set. Okay. Um, you, you have um, you know, Job is a good man. He seems to be, you know, uh, like God's blessing him. Uh, he's got it good. He's wealthy. Uh, he's blessed with family. He's blessed with material wealth. Uh, things are really going good for Job. And then uh, Act One, the 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 screen that, if you will, the curtain is unveiled, and we get to see about the dimension in heaven. And so there's there's God uh, and a spiritual realm going on, and Satan ha happens to be there, you know. And, and if you, if you know, excuse my paraphrasing. Uh, Satan, what you been up to? Satan, I've been just going two and four, you know, looking to get in trouble, you know, seeing how I can, you know, make miserable. Uh, and so that's sort of what Satan's saying, you know. Here's, here's I'm doing what I'm just doing what Satan does, you know. Uh, now we need to carefully understand the Hebrew word here for Satan is the Hebrew word Satan. I don't know if I'm saying it just right, but the, but it's it's it, it's interesting because it reveals his character and something about him. So we just transliterated it and made it into Satan, but probably a better interpretation of what he, he's the accuser. Satan is the accuser. So in this, in this situation, he's accusing Job of only being faithful and loving God for what he's getting out of God, getting from God. So, and so that, 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 that his blasphemy against Job and God says, have you ever considered Job? And he says, I can't touch him. You know, he, he, you, know he, you and him are just like this, you know. There's no way, you know. Uh, and, then, and then, so, this is interesting. Because we think of the word blasphemy, like Holy Spirit, and, you know, and something like that. But what he does, he blasphemes Job. He speaks against Job. It says Job is just a... He's just a gold digger God. Let me take his stuff away from him and he will turn against you. And so this is an odd perspective. You don't have to agree with me. But God loves Job too much to let someone blaspheme him. And God says, mm -mm, not Job. You're not going to blaspheme Job. And I'm going to let you test your hypothesis. Because I know him. I know him. And so Job unleashes what he thinks he can. To, I mean, so Satan, Satan, the accuser, releases what he thinks he can against Job. And, and you know, he loses flocks. You know, he loses herds. And then he loses kids. You know, and, and then, then, then Job, he opens his mouth. You know, uh, well, chapter 1, verse 22, it, it, I think that's important. Job fell, I mean, go, go up to verse 20. He hears what's happened. He tears his robe. He begins his lament, his grief. And he says, I mean, verse 20 says, he fell to the ground and, what does your Bible say? worshipped hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. If you've ever been in a situation of sudden loss and so let's go worship. Let's go praise God. Let's go reach our hands toward heaven. No. But again, it reveals something about Job's character. At the possibly the darkest moment of his life at this point, he still honors God. And worship can simply mean, let's be fair, it's not necessarily, you know, singing praise songs. You know, worship can simply mean to prostrate oneself before. He fell down before God. Let's be fair with the, what the word could mean there. He just prostrated himself before God. Naked came out from a mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He says God's sovereign. God is in control. God gives, God takes away. God's not changed his character. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't want to ever be tested this way because I don't know that I personally would have that kind of resolve. But he says, God is great. God is good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But in verse 22, he says, he did not sin. And we're going to go in and see what all he says later, but, well, to some degree. Um, and, you know, verse 9 is when his wife says, you know, um, you know, after Job is afflicted, Job did not sin. So Satan says, well, let me have another shot at him. God says, okay, you can take anything you want, but not his life. So Satan afflicts him physically. Now his health is gone. His kids are gone. His flocks are gone. His herds are gone. His servants are gone. And now his health is gone. So that's when his wife in, in chapter 2 says, you know, just curse God and die, please. And then he says, you speak like a foolish woman. And he says, if we're willingly glad to accept good from God, why would we not expect, accept bad from God? Again, something to his, to, his, to his indication of who he is with God. And then in verse 10, it's very, even more explicitly, he did not sin with his lips. So then it, it, it's one of the most poignant <coughs> scenes in, in Scripture. It's poignant. His friends come, to they hear what happened to Job. Have you heard what happened to Job? They come to Job's house and they sit for seven days in silence. The Jewish people call it sitting shiva, S-H-I-V-A. And it's still practiced in very um, orthodox, conservative Jewish homes. They still will sit shiva. So you'll seven days, when you have someone die in the house, you cover all the mirrors with, with black drape. You're not supposed to look. You're supposed to, you know, be in mourning. Uh, and, and, and you sit, you sit and, and how we would have, you know, like in a funeral home, where the family stands up and they receive guests, whatever, people would come to their home or maybe the mortuary or whatever. And the family would sit and, and people would just come speak, speak good things of the deceased. And there's a seven day period of mourning that, that, that's done that. So and it's sort of taken from Job, to sit Shiva means you sit and support, you know. It's beautiful, it's poignant, you know. They're, they're sitting there and then they open their mouth and it goes downhill from there, <laughs> okay. They begin, it goes down here really fast because they're of the persuasion in the mindset, and, and we all still struggle with it, is this thing called retribution theology. Retribution theology says, if you're good, you get good. If you're bad, you get bad. And so if you get bad, you must have done something wrong, and you need to confess it, okay? Uh, and if you're good means, okay, things are good, things happen. So retribution theology is something that, that man sort of defaults to, you know? Uh, if, if you wake up in the morning, you know, and you're ready to go to work or you need to go to the store or whatever, and you got a flat tire on the car. Your first thing, why is this happening to me? Okay. Uh, you know, why me? You know, the battery's in. Why me? You know, you lock yourself, why me? You know, what have I done wrong? You know, we, we tend to do that. But his friends really offer explanations that, Job, you need to confess your sin. 
you need to acknowledge your wrongness before God, you know. Uh, and, 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 and clearly, you know, the scripture says early on that Job was a man who was so self-conscious that he even made sacrifices in case his kids messed up. I mean, he, he was so cognizant of his, of, his, of, his, of, his, of his own personal weaknesses and recognizing, hey, they're my kids, <laughs> probably struggle the same thing I struggle with. You know, he's sacrificing things right and left just to make sure that family stays in covenant relationship with God. It, it, it's not that he's, he's perceived to be, he's not perceived himself to be holier than now. You know, he says, you know, I'm living a confessional sacrificial lifestyle. So don't you dare tell me that I've done something to brought this about, okay? And, and, then, and there's another passage, I can't remember which chapter it is. Job says, I've even made a covenant with my eyes. You know, and, and some people have taken from that that Job was very mindful of the, the capacity for lust. So he wouldn't look at a pretty girl twice because he, he made a covenant with his eyes that, you know, I'm not going to look, you know, and, and lust, you know. Uh, and so there's a, there's a whole, uh, I can't remember that, that, that uh, I... Uh, uh, a Christian uh, writer that talks about, you know, teaching people, especially for men, to make covenants with their eyes, you know, uh, to, to, not, to not look, to not gaze, to not lust, you know, but let your eyes bounce. So Eliphaz offers things, you know, uh, he, he talks about his own theology of God um, and, um, and that sort of God really doesn't put too much confidence in, in man. Uh, and he makes, and then Bildad, the Shuite, he makes, he makes things. He tries to argue. He, he, he borrows from nature. If you look at your Bible, a lot of eight, nine, and so forth, it looks like, it looks like poetry. It's how it's set off. This is poetic. Um, and there's all these explanations. What's interesting is that his friends like to borrow elements from nature, you know, Paul argues in Romans chapter one that God's divine attributes make clearly evident in his creation. His friends say, yeah. I mean, they're, they're referencing constellations, Pleiades, you know, they're referencing, you know, they're referencing the, the, the marsh growing, you know, papyrus growing in the marsh. They're, ref they're, they're referencing things in nature to try to, uh, try to build up their argument. Um, Zophar uh, off, also said, you know, um, you know, you just need to, you know, you're not going to vindicate yourself, confess your problems. Uh, and then in chapter 12, then Job gives his response. And, and, and Job does a lot to say, I'm, I'm okay. It, 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 it's not about me. You know, in chapter 14, he talks about just the status of, of life. Man is born and woman is born in a few days. You know, he, come, he comes forth like a flower and fades away, like a shadow and does not continue. And you do open your eyes to such a one and bring judgment you know, on me with yourself. In other words, you're no better than me. We all have the same destination. We all have this. Um, and, and Job is pretty much focused in on vindicating his self. So he, he refutes time and time again his friend's comments. Um, you know, uh, 16, we have another uh, diatribe of Job. Um, and, um, and, you know, he, he recognizes God's sovereignty. He says, for some reason, God has delivered me to the ungodly. Um, you know, my spirit is broken. The grave's ready for me. Uh, and he says, you guys are markers, markers now, mockers, you know. Um, and... Um, uh, and he says, you know, you're, you're clueless. Verse 4, you've hidden your heart from understanding. Uh, you're pretty much clueless. Um, and, um, and he says, you just can't see anything. Um, 19. Um, it's pretty interesting. Beginning in verse 23, chapter 19, verse 23. Oh, that my words were written, which ironically they are, but oh, that they were inscribed in a book, which ironically they are, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and led forever. 
So he wants them engraved. Verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, the word Redeemer there is capitalized in most texts. Do you see that? Yeah, so the New King James, I don't know if the NIV capitalizes or not, does it? Okay. The word there, the original Hebrew word there is goel. G-O-E-L. And goel was your kinsman redeemer. If you got sold into slavery, your goel could buy you out of slavery. They would have to lay you by them out of slavery. In the book of Ruth, um, Boaz is a goel. He's a kinsman redeemer. He can redeem his, he can redeem Ruth in the name of her husband and because he's a cousin of the husband. So it, it's, not, it's not just that my deliverer's coming, but it's my kinsman redeemer. Most Bible scholars have chosen to capitalize this because he's referencing God. That God is my kinsman redeemer. And so he is my Goel. He is my kinsman redeemer. And so he shall stand, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. That in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Had to write a paper on the book of Job, and this was a text I chose several years ago. It, it one it, we, we turned it into a song. I know that my redeemer lives and ever stands for me. But it, it, it's it's unusual that at a, such an early point in time, Job is conceptualizing eternal life. He says, there's got to be more than this. And I know, I know that I'm going to see it with my own eyes. So he's, he, he's almost implying a resurrection, right? Not, not his buried body, but his whole body. And he's going to see his kinsman redeemer. This is really important, Okay. Uh, there's a few references in the Old Testament that imply David does it a few times, uh, but but there's not a clear explanation of immortality as we understand it from what Christ taught us about it. Because even when Jesus came along, several centuries later, the Jewish community was still divided. The Sadducee says there is no resurrection. The Sadducees said, when you're dead, you're dead like rubber, you're dead all over, and that's it. So whatever good happens here and whatever happens, you just, you just go to the pit, chill, the, you know, the pit. But Job very early says, because of his own experience, there's got to be more than this. There, there, you know, God being who God is, there has to be a justification. He's got to make things right because that's who he is. And so it's, it's really, 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 really important. Uh, they don't listen to him. They, they go on to argue against his position on that. Um, and then Job says, you know, um, I, I can't hardly deal with you. Come for me anymore. Let me bear your consolation. Uh, you know, just listen to me. Uh, and then um, Eliphaz, there's this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and then... Uh, for many chapters, and a lot of references to nature and how things work in nature. Um, and so, um, eventually, uh, we have a young man who begins speaking up against uh, Eliehu in verse 34. And he, he says some things. And some of the things he says is, you know, you guys aren't too good at helping. And then Job, you've been so quickly to defend yourself, but who defended God? You know, Eliehu who says, we lost God in this discussion. And, and, he, and he really elevates God, you know. Uh, and then 
then in verse 38, God starts talking and God answered Job. And God never really answers Job's questions. God answers Job's questions and more questions. Like, how did this happen? Who did this? What about this Job? What about this Job? What about this Job? You know, uh, and we have in here, you know, the references to Behith Moss and Leviathans, which we don't know. Uh, is he referencing, you know, uh, known animals that we have today, or is he referencing, you know, animals that, that no longer exist? Uh, you know, had people even say he's referencing, you know, dinosaurs, you know, these things, things not sounds like, you know, legs like trees and so forth. And other people say, ah, oh, there's an elephant, you know, so. Uh, but, you know, God asked about goats, God asked about eagles, God asked about all these things. Uh, and then verse, 30, verse 41, so who can draw the Leviathan out with a hook? Uh, and so uh, some kind of sea creature. Um, and the Job said, God, you can do anything you want to do. Verse 42, you can do everything. And so if there's no purpose of yours that's going to be withheld from you. In fact, he, he argues it's God's sovereign. God will do what God will do. And so 42 sort of brings us to the end of the book. Um, and then in verse 6 of 42, Job repents. Job said, I got you wrong, God. I said some things about you weren't true. Now what's interesting, God pretty much tells the friends, you're the worst counselors there are. And you better hope this righteous man, Job, will make sacrifice for you. And, and in fact, you know, me and Job, still, we're still on the same team. You, you need him to advocate for you, you know, because you're really bad, bad, bad counselors. Um, and so... Uh, they'd been better if they kept their mouth shut. So, um, you know, verse 7, you know, I'm mad at you, my, to Eliphaz. Uh, and then he says, you know, make, make sacrifice. Uh, and, um, and he says, what you said about Job simply wasn't the truth. You said Job was being punished because Job said something wrong. That wasn't the, the case. Um, and, you know, go and, and make sacrifice. Um, and... Um, Study Job. Learn from him. So they did what God told them to do. And then verse 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses and prayed for his friends when he prayed for his friends. So it's interesting that, that God says, okay, you, you make things right with them, I make things right with you. So he prayed for his friends. Uh, and God gave to Job twice as much as he had before. And then everyone came around that ate, ate food, that consoled and comforted him uh, for all the adversity the Lord brought upon him. And everyone blessed him with gifts, gold rings and pieces of silver. And verse 12 is that commentary that ladder was better than the beginning. Again, an inventory of his stocks, uh, his flocks and, and herds and livestock. And he had seven sons and three daughters. And he caused the first of Jemima in the name of second Keziah, and the name of third Karen Hoppich, and these each mean specifically different things in Hebrew. Uh, if someone has a footnote, can share. I forgot what they specifically mean. Um, and Job's daughters were beautiful. Nobody's pretty as Job's daughters. Uh, apparently, his turkey didn't fare as well, but his daughters were pretty. Um, and he lived to be 140 years, and he saw his children and grandchildren for four generations, and then he died old, full of days. I'm not exactly for sure. It's probably a matter of, of weeks or, or I don't know for sure. It doesn't say. Other comments or I'll give you some takeaways to consider. Yes, Herb. It is hard. I can't, I'm not going to be like Eliphaz and, 
and, and, and the guys to give a simple answer. It's hard. The question of human suffering is hard. Uh, why does good things happen to bad people and, and, I mean, and bad things happen to good people? The nature of human suffering is really, really hard. You know, we live in a broken world that was broken because of sin, and people get hurt. Innocent people get hurt. Um, anyway, it's a beautiful story. It, it, it's a beautiful story. Uh, it, it, it's a story that's really rich to stimulate imagination. Uh, I, I, I visualize a lot of these things. Um, there is a thing I think we need to consider, and this comes up more than once. It comes up again in the book of Daniel. There's a spiritual dimension that things are happening in. Um, there are forces of evil at play in this world. And the forces of evil interact with willing men and women. Uh, and, and they have an agenda. Um, the book of Daniel, Daniel prays, you know, and, and finally Micah shows up and Daniel says, what gives? You know, I prayed a long time ago. And Daniel says, there was a war in heaven. You know, we've been fighting it. You know, give us a break. Everything you see is not what you see. Paul talks about the, 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 the evilness that happens in principalities and rules and dominions, you know, and, and wickedness in spiritual places. So I think that we need to be aware that there's something going on besides what we know. Um, and we can't always understand in human terms what's happening, uh, conceptualizing things. Um, I have a hard time with, with the loss of children and understanding that. Um, but maybe 19 was born out of the fact that Job had to believe his kids had something else better beyond this life. That God, you know, they were maybe in the presence of his kinsman redeemer, his Goel. Um, God's people do suffer. Uh, retribution theology is not true. You know, bad things happen to good people for no good reason other than sin broke the world. Um, and you can't always judge a person spirituality by their prosperity or their poverty. You know, you can't say this man's blessed because he's got a, you know, look what he always got. He must really be blessed or this man must be really not good because look what he doesn't have and stuff. Um, God always has a reason. We, we talked Sunday about the refining process, the pencil story, you know, uh, you're leaving a mark, you know, but ultimately, you know, God is there with us always. Um, and We need to be practiced at worship. So worship becomes a default when things get bad. I think Job was so ingrained in worshiping God, I think he did it all the time, that when, when, the, when the bad things happened, his default was worship. And I think that that's one of the reasons being called together, worshiping together, assembling together, is for us to be well practiced in worship. So when tough things happen, we fall to our knees. We turn to God. You know, and, and, and we do that. It, 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 it's tough. It's really, really tough text and stuff. So appreciate everyone's participation and attendance. Uh, so uh, we're going to do an aspirational thing. We're starting Psalms next Wednesday night. Uh, and we're going to hit, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to stop Psalms in, in 35, 40 minutes. <laughs> so aspirationally.
858 will be our song of encouragement uh, here in just a moment. 858. Believe it or not, I don't have a whole lot to say tonight. Can you can you believe it? Uh, no. Um, real quickly, I was just reminded of something uh, today uh, and tonight as well. I was reminded of how easily it is to become distracted. How easily it is to become distracted on the things in life that aren't as important. Uh, to let those things cloud the importance of, I don't know, maybe your family, maybe your spouse, the church, uh, a friend. It's really easy to become distracted with things that are bad, maybe even some things that in and of themselves aren't necessarily bad. To lose sight of the most important things uh, in your life and then to find yourself at the bottom thinking, what have I done? What have I done? In Luke chapter 10, when I think about distraction, when I think about about the most important thing being right in front of you and allowing yourself to become distracted by so many different things. I think about the story that Luke records for us of Mary and Martha. In verse 38 of Luke 10, the text says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Martha got, or Mary, excuse me, Martha got so distracted by all the stuff that needed to be done in her eyes that she missed the most important that was right in front of her. Tell my sister to quit being lazy and get up and help me. She says, you don't get it. You're so distracted by all this stuff that you've missed the most important thing, and that's exactly what your sister was doing, sitting at my feet, learning from me. I think the Hebrew author kind of correlates well with this, but he puts it a little differently. He says, let us lay aside every every sin and every weight that easily besets us. Let us run this race with endurance, looking to who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't become so distracted that you lose sight of what's most important. He says, look, you're going to have the cloud of witness. You're going to have those in Hebrews 11 cheering you on. Don't become so distracted at the crowd that you take your eyes off of Jesus. Don't become so distracted by sin that you lose sight of what's most important. But he says, and wait, not just sin, and wait. See, I don't think that the wait and the sin are the same thing there. I think sin is sin, and I think wait is all the other stuff in this world that we become distracted with. He says, if it's taking your eyes off of Jesus, it's not worth it. If it's taking your eyes off what's most important, it's not worth it. I'm 33 years old and I still need to be reminded of that. Don't get so caught up 
in the things of this life that you lose sight of what's most important. Mary got it. If Mary can get it, I believe we can get it. So who are you tonight, a Mary or a Martha? Who am I tonight, a Mary or a Martha? Tonight, if you need to become a Christian, realizing that is the most important thing in your life to focus on, and that's submitting your life to Jesus, we want to help you with that need. If you're a Christian and you're struggling, you become distracted, it's easy to do. But that's why we're supposed to have one another to lean on, to encourage, to strengthen. So if you have a spiritual need tonight, please come while we stand and while we sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus falleth tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth, turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye song be number 664 we'll sing the first verse 664 what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to care God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. 
all because we do not carry everything to God in Father, as we leave here this evening, we, we pray that we will take your word and, and put it in our hearts, Father, and, and share it with as many people that we can get to listen, Father. We, we pray that we will keep, keep Jesus close to our hearts and always remember to use him as our guide and, and try to be more like him every day. Father, we pray that you bless us and go with us, keep us safe, and, and always uh, in your hand. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen.